All right, welcome back. Uh, so this afternoon session, uh, the main focus is going to be functional annotation and analysis of transcripts. Uh, the, the lecture portion here is actually going to be kind of on the short side. Uh, we're going to have more time for the lab. The lab is a little bit more expensive. Uh, there's a lot of information to cover there. And hopefully it'll be bringing together uh, parts of uh, what you've learned over the last couple of days in addition to some new stuff. So for this last module, um, certain learning objectives. And we're going to explore the different methods that are available to glean biological function from transcript sequences. And we want to be able to differentiate between uh, homology-based and sequence composition based functional inference. So two major ways of going about predicting functions of your transcripts or any proteins that they might encode. So when we do a transcript assembly, we end up with a, a FASTA file containing our transcript sequences and essentially you know, strings of nucleotides, right? And we need to figure out you know, why, you know, why is this transcript important? Well, functionally, what does it represent? What is it doing? Yeah, can, we, can we gather hints of biological function from this raw sequence data? And there are a couple ways of going about doing that. Uh, the most uh, straightforward way is to look for a sequence homology. All right, so we take that transcript sequence and we can search it against a database of all known biological sequences and ask, you know, are there other sequences that are similar to this? And are they similar enough such that we might uh, infer that, that maybe they're related in some way? And um, if that protein that it matches to has a known function, perhaps this transcript that we're looking at uh, encodes a protein that has a similar function. Alternatively, we might look at sequence composition itself. You know, are there, are there signals within the sequence that might suggest a certain type of function? Uh, so there are neural networks, hidden Markov models, there are various uh, types of machine learning methods that we can use, uh, such like pattern recognition algorithms for uh, looking for sequence features that are, are conserved and uh, could be indicative of uh, a function. Uh, starting with, with uh, database searches, the most common way of doing a database search is to use the BLAST program. If we're starting with a transcript sequence, we can use the BLAST X utility uh, to effectively search protein database with a six frame translation of that transcript sequence. If we have um, a protein encoded within our transcript, hopefully we'll, we'll detect homology that way. Uh, or we could perform a BLAST-P instead of a BLAST-X if we have the protein sequence to do a more direct search. Uh, but sticking with uh, the nucleotide BLAST for now, uh, we'll search our protein database. There's a nice collection of protein sequences that are available in uh, SwissPro. SwissPro is part of the Unipro knowledge base, uh, which includes uh, Tremble, which is essentially a, a non-redundant database of all known sequences and translated. Uh, you can see there's 114 million sequences as of, let's see, did it, no, I didn't indicate that. So uh, fairly recently, I just, just put this together or updated it within the last week, I believe. Um, so there's 114 million sequences, uh, protein sequences. Now, SwissPro is a manually annotated and reviewed subset of this that has 557,000 sequences. And that was as of, okay, so that was as of May 2018, so in the last week or so. And, it's, and SwissPro is really one of the best resources for doing this kind of search, right? Because there's, there's a lot of information that's tied to each one of these SwissPro records as they've been manually curated. Uh, just to give you an example, there's, there's one record that we find in the SwissPro database, and it'll tell us uh, information about the, the function, the known function. We have... Um, we have gene ontology terms. Everyone familiar with gene ontology? Yeah. All right. Okay. So it's a structured vocabulary for defining the molecular functions, uh, and it's broken down into a few different sections. You have molecular function, biological process, and cellular component. And it's it's structured in a, in a graph. 
right? so it's basically a directed graph, and we talked about directed graphs uh, earlier this morning. Uh, instead of having a directed graphs with, with k-mers or sequence data, this is a directed graph with terms, where each node is a, is a description of a, in this case, molecular function. And uh, it has, there are, are parent terms and child terms. And you have edges that are of different types. So there's an is a part of, and um, for example, if we have this, this one protein, I wonder if I can zoom this out a little bit more. Look at that. Uh, this is there one protein of interest, which is a fructosamine three kinase activity. Uh, we know that, that it's also a kinase, right? And, and it's, it's part of phosphorylation. Basically, all these parent terms apply to this protein. You basically get more and more, um, or a lot less specific, basically. Bro you get more broad in terms of your terms as you go up the, the, the hierarchy. One of the things that's useful about gene ontology is once you have assignments to different products, you can look for enrichment. So if you're doing something like expression analysis and you have a set of, of transcripts that are found to be differentially expressed, uh, you might be interested in, you know, are there certain pathways or certain functions that are, are enriched among that set, right? And give you more information about the biology. Uh, so we can run, you know, basically run a statistical test and run enrichment tests. Uh, given gene ontology terms. And typically what it'll look like is a matrix like this, uh, where you have, um, it's, it's a contingency table, where we have differential expressed on one axis and gene ontology terms on the other axis. And um, you just break up your terms in here. In this case, you get 50, 50 uh, transcripts that are differentially expressed and, um, and they have you know, gene ontology assignments. And we ask, you know, is, does this indicate that it's enriched? It's, it's, it's very similar to the, the problem, you know, the classic statistical problem where you have a, a, you have a jar that's filled with marbles, right? And you've got uh, two kinds of marbles. You've got green marbles and red marbles. And then you have drawn or not drawn. So in this case, uh, drawn, you know, in, in, in the context of differential expressed, uh, you know, a drawn marble is basically a, a transcript that we find is differential expressed. And um, instead of being green or red, it has a gene ontology term associated with it, or it doesn't have that gene ontology term associated with it. All right, and you can you can run it through uh, this formula in order to calculate the probability of seeing such an, an event. And um, so this is useful. You get, you get probabilities for uh, whether you're enriched for having certain types of functions. And there's there's tools that that are used, like there's a tool called GoSeq. Uh, that includes um, all the statistical analysis. So if you can, run, you can combine differential expression analysis with uh, your gene ontology category assignments and, uh, and look for terms that are statistically enriched and it could be indicative of, uh, of, of that, that biology. And in the case of SwissPro, if, um, if you have a match to a SwissPro record and that SwissPro record has, or you have a match to a SwissPro protein and within that protein record in SwissPro, it indicates that it has certain gene ontology terms. You can basically um, you can apply those gene ontology terms, you know, transitively to, to your transcript or protein of interest. So it's a nice, easy way to to capture gene ontology terms for for your transcripts if you have homology. Uh, but if you don't have significant sequence homology from doing your blast search, you know, what else can you do? Uh, we can ask questions like, is there is there an open reading frame for a potential coding region? All right, so we just kind of scan through the sequence and see, you know, do I find start codons and stop codons? And does it look like there's a, a nice long open reading frame that's uninterrupted? Uh, I mean, for example, and here we find uh, ATG and we keep going on, eventually we find a stop codon that's in frame. You know, does this look like a, a reasonable coding region? You can use a tool like WARF Finder, where you can, you can input your transcript sequence and, uh, and look for all the different possible ORFs. Uh, it's just an example, put in a long transcript sequence, and then hit submit, and then it'll return to you a whole bunch of, of different open reading frames that we find within that sequence. And usually, you know, if you have a nice long open reading frame, it's unlikely to happen by chance, but this is very much tied to the nucleotide composition. You know, if, you're, if you're a GC rich, uh, then you there's a paucity of, of, uh, of uh, stop codons. And, uh, 
and you can have long, really long open reading frames just purely by chance. So it's really it's tied to the um, the GC content, whether you find long open reading frames just purely by chance or not. <clears throat> but there are tools that can take the, the sequence composition and uh, determine if it really looks like it has, it has codon uh, metrics that are similar to other coding sequences. All right? and, um, and there are tools uh, such as uh, Transdecoder, it's a tool that, that we developed, where it'll find all open reading frames within your transcripts, uh, but then it applies a, a Markov model to score each of the ORFs and determine um, yeah, what, what the, uh, whether it looks like it's an actual coding sequence or not. Can we recognize functional domains in predictive coding regions? So there's, uh, you do PFAM searches. There's a database of, of, uh, P, of, of hidden Markov profiles uh, that are made based on conserved regions of domains. And you can search your open reading frame against that, that, that collection of, of PFAM profiles. And look, you see uh, evidence for a domain that might have something to do with calcium binding or, or DNA binding. Uh, or some uh, catalytic function, like glycosylase or methylase. So this is one of the best tools available for characterizing functions of, of your sequences. Take your open reading frame, put it in the, in this case you have a web-based interface, you can just drop your sequence in, into the text box and press go, and it'll return to you um, all the domains that it finds, right, from searching the, this uh, database of, of Markov, hidden Markov models. And based on individual domains that you find within the sequence, that could be um, interpreted as, a, as functional, or it could be the, the, co the whole combination of domains. Like in this case, you get a whole bunch of different domains. And based on this combination of domains, you might be able to uh, figure out what its function might be. Uh, other types of tools, like um, there's a tool called TMHMM, they can use for finding transmembrane domains. So you just input your protein sequence, and it'll try to find uh, domains that look like they're uh, hydrophobic regions in your protein that might cross a lipid bilayer or cross multiple times. So here's a case where we just have one uh, membrane domain. Here it goes back and forth a bunch of times. Here it goes back and forth a bunch of times as well. Uh, so tool we'll use for this is called TMHMM. Most of these tools have, have web websites where you can just input a protein sequence. When you're doing this for you know, many thousands of sequences, you're not going to do it this way. Right? We have a command line tool that will run and, and capture the information, running lots of sequences through. Uh, so TMHMM, this is what this might look like. Uh, we run it through, and we get a nice picture showing uh, individual regions within the sequence that look like they're, um, they're predicted to be transmembrane domains. So if we know nothing else about this protein sequence, we know that it has an architecture that, that's consistent with it being a transmembrane protein, which is better than nothing. And uh, does the protein have a secretion signal? Or does it look like it's a secreted protein? If we know nothing else, maybe we can just detect that it has a secretion protein at its end terminus. And there's, there are various tools to do this. There's uh, some sequence context for secretion signals at the end terminus of a protein. You've got a hydrophobic region here, or was it a hydrophilic actually? Hydrophilic region at the very end terminus with the positive charge, hydrophobic center, and a hydrophilic uh, polar sequence at the end. And these are really short sequences, I mean, 30 to 70 amino acids at the very end terminus. Uh, Do you need a secretion signal for transmembrane proteins? Oh, this, is, this is different. So transmembrane proteins you know, we run TMHMM and look for this, this kind of signal. Right. All right. Uh, this is just uh, a secretion signal. All right. Uh, some of these might actually be transmembrane anchors, too. All right. It's hard to tell the difference if it's a transmembrane anchor or it's a, a secretion signal. Um, and so a lot of times the signal peptide predictors will actually predict signal peptides uh, when they're cases where they're actually um, anchored into the membrane. And it's not just secretion. Uh, Signal P, the latest version of, of the software, Signal P, um, is much better about that. So actually, it takes into account transmembrane domains as well as uh, the secretion signal to do a better job at predicting just the, the secreted proteins. Um, 
again, just you know, pop in your sequence. And it has, it's, it's, this is based on a neural network, I believe, and it's, it's trained for different like eukaryotes versus uh, gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria. So you have to indicate what organism you're working with. Uh, and it'll give you a few different scores. It has a signal peptide score. It has, looks for a, a cleavage site because the signal peptide is, is cleaved off as part of the secretion machinery. Uh, and it generates a, a combined score. And you basically just get a list of your secreted, your predicted secreted proteins. And again, it's just one of those things that if you have if you have no sequence homology, you know you don't really have a whole lot of other information to go by. There's no, no like domains that are, are showing up. Um, you know, it might be a, if it's a secreted peptide. You know, it could be it could be useful information, particularly if this, this, the transcript for this peptide turns out to be really highly differential expressed. It's like one of your best candidates from your differential expression screen. You know nothing else about it, but it's got a nice open reading frame and it's got a strong uh, secretion signal at the end terminus. You know, it, it's uh, it's good useful information to know. Uh, so we have a tool that we developed uh, to try to to organize all this information, the homology information, and all the the prediction. Uh, the prediction results that you get from running tools like secretion signals or transmembrane uh, domains, and uh, it's called Trinotate. And it also includes our, our transdecoder software for predicting coding regions within within transcripts. It integrates uh, gene ontology as well. Um, essentially, the way the way this works is that you um, give your transcript set. I don't think I have a slide in here that, that walks through the whole all the details. No, I don't. Okay. So you have your transcript set. Uh, we'll run it through Trans Decoder uh, to predict all the coding regions within the transcripts. Um, we'll search the transcript sequences directly against SwissPro to identify homologs. We'll also search the, the protein coding predictions against SwissPro using BLASP. Um, We'll take the protein coding regions and we'll uh, we'll search them through TMHMM via transmembrane domains, signal P for secretion signals. We then um, we organize everything into a relational database uh, that's that's really structured to capture all the information from SwissPro records. All right, so basically all of SwissPro has been previously parsed and stored into this this relational database, and um, if we have a a good protein match, or even at the transcript level match to to a Swiss Pro entry, we can capture all that Swiss Pro entry attributes like gene ontology assignments. All right, so if it has if that entry has a molecular function assigned or uh, biological process, we can capture that and basically apply that those terms to our sequence of interest, and we can sort of tie this all together with the expression information too. So if we have different, if we have expression information, we have differential expression results. Um, we can tie that together, get our genotology uh, assignments. We can do use GoSeq for doing the um, the enrichment analysis or statistical enrichment analysis. Uh, so all this stuff is sort of tied together and wrapped around this this Trinotate software. And of course, there's no substitute for experimentally validating different protein functions. That goes without saying, maybe. And for the, the workshop that we're going to be doing, the practical that we're going to be doing, revolves around our, our Trinity protocol. Okay, so the way this works is we start with a bunch of samples. These could be your different experimental conditions, right? Or they could be different tissue samples. Um, and for each one of your conditions, you're going to want to have multiple replicates from RNA-seq. You probably talked about this yesterday. Right, for differential expression, you really need to have biological replicates. All right, so you have each sample. Within each sample, you've got at least a few biological replicates. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a Trinity genome-free de novo assembly. And this requires that we combine all the reads. Okay, so we combine all the reads into just one big sample, uh, and that's what we generate our, our Trinity assembly on. There is a normalization process that's, that's sort of baked into Trinity right now. So if you have, yeah, you know, if you end up starting out with like a billion reads, you, you really don't need to have a billion reads to generate transcript assembly. You know, if you have, if, because of the dynamic range of, of gene expression, you know, you get lowly expressed transcripts, highly expressed transcripts. For highly expressed transcripts, you really just need a moderate number of reads in order to reconstruct that transcript, right? You don't need a, a you don't need a million x coverage. 
you know, 100x coverage or 50x coverage might be just fine. Uh, so we have a process in here that actually looks at the, um, the, the amount of read support uh, for each read. It does this using uh, Kamer values. And um, it basically will toss reads into two bins, right? One, one bin is uh, the bin that we're going to assemble. And the other bin is just the excess reads that we really don't need for assembly because we already have enough uh, for the highly expressed transcripts. Uh, and just give you an example of, of you know what kind of what you kind of see here sometimes with our, our salamander transcriptome assembly that we published last year. Um, we started off with about one and a half billion reads, all right. But after normalization, we ended up with less than a hundred million reads. So that's a huge reduction, all right. Less than ten percent of the reads we needed for for assembly. So just a lot of excess, and we need we need to know this when we're doing quantification. But for the assembly process, uh, we don't need to have all those excess reads. We put it through t Trinity, do our, our assembly, and once we have our assembly, then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to measure expression levels uh, for each one of our samples, and more specifically, for each replicate within each of our samples. Yes. Sorry, did you already say? what it is normalized to when you combine the reads? Uh, the normalization, yeah. it's, it's based on, it's based on um, Kamer composition. Uh, so what it does is it, it first takes all the reads, it counts up all the Kamers, mm -hmm. and then based on the, the, the Kamer, basically after it has the, this database of Kamers, you know, for every Kamer it knows how many times it's seen it within all the reads. It then goes through the reads again. And, um, and based on the Kamer composition of the reads, it can stochastically either keep the read or throw it out, um, assuming that we want to have 50x coverage instead of, you know, it could be a 10,000x coverage or something. All right, because we have we have the read, and you look at like how often were the Kamers found. We just take like the median the median Kamer abundance. Um, based on that, you can sort of use that as a proxy for how many times you've seen that kind of read within your data set. And if you only want it 50x, well then you just basically sample it so that on average you get 50x coverage instead of, you know, 10,000x. So it's going to compress some data. Yeah, it's like a data compression, sure. Um, and it's it's different than just doing subsampling, right? You have to start out with a billion reads and you just randomly take 100 million reads. That's very different than doing normalization because normalization, you're just removing the excess reads for the abundant transcripts. If you're downsampling, then everything gets downsampled. The low expressed stuff gets downsampled at the same rate that the highly expressed. So it's a it's a different process. Okay, so um, for abundance estimation, and we're gonna use we're gonna use a tool called Salmon for doing this. Uh, we're basically gonna quantitate each replicate for each sample, and that's gonna give us an expression matrix. We'll have all of our transcripts as rows, and we'll have all of our replicates, sample replicates as columns. Once we have that, we can run a differential expression analysis. For that, we'll use bioconductor tools. Um, yesterday, you used, used ball gown as part of the tuxedo package. Uh, here, we'll use um, either Edge R or DEseq2. They're also bioconductor packages. Uh, they're all very flexible. Uh, Edge R and DEseq2 are, are also two of the most popular tools for doing differential expression. Uh, and then once we have that, we can, um, we can cluster transcripts. Um, and uh, we're not going to do, I don't think we're going to do gene ontology enrichment analysis, but what we're going to do is we're going to we're do functional annotation next. Okay, so we're going to uh, extract coding regions, or we're basically going to run Trinitate. We're going to extract coding regions, uh, we're going to do blast searches, we're going to do TMHMM, signal P. Uh, we're going to take all those results, including all of our expression analysis and our differential expression results, and we're going to put them all into our, our Trinitate relational database. Okay. Uh, and this is going to generate an annotation report. All right. Then the, the fun part is that this, this actually comes with a little web web based uh, navigation tool, so we can fire up uh, Trinitate Web, and that provides us with a nice interactive way of exploring our functional annotations and also ex exploring our um, our expression data. Okay. So that'll be the fun part that we'll finish with. And I told you this part was going to be short, and I didn't lie. It's uh, annotation lab time. <laughs>